Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial, a museum and research center dedicated to preserving and presenting the history of General Douglas MacArthur, which includes the story of World War I and that of the millions of men and women who served in that war. In October 2016, the World War I Historical Association hosted a World War I Centennial Symposium at the MacArthur Memorial. The symposium focused on the year 1916. The following is a presentation by Dr. David Silby, the Associate Director of the Cornell and Washington Program and an expert on the industrialized total wars of the 20th century. Dr. Silby delivered a talk entitled, A Citizen Army Learns to Fight, The Tactical Evolution of the British Army in 1916. I'd like, uh, first off, I'd like to thank uh, the association for bringing me down. Um, it's quite wonderful to be in a room full of folks who are working on and interested in the First World War. Um, it's not a war that has often, uh, it's a war that has sometimes gotten lost in American history and to Americans where I think sometimes we go from the Civil War uh, to World War II, uh, Gettysburg to Pearl Harbor and skip over uh, the last few, uh, the last uh, couple of years of World War I. Um, what I'd like to do today, however, is not talk about the American side of it, but talk about the British side of it, and specifically the British Army uh, side of it. And what I want to take as my theme today is the fact that uh, armies, and in this case the British Army, often learn to fight even as they are in the middle of the war that they are learning how to fight. And I think this is particularly true of the British Army in the First World War, that they actually figured out what they were doing in the process of doing it. And one of the reasons why the casualties uh, were so catastrophically high and there was such a stalemate on the Western Front for so long was because all of the armies uh, on the Western Front um, were figuring out how to do this new kind of industrialized and mechanized uh, warfare. Um, and I note that this learning, and, and I want to talk about this, this learning was going on at all levels. We sometimes pay most of the attention to the generals, Haig, Foch, um, Pershing, and so on, but an army learns at every level, general, uh, colonels, um, combat officers, staff officers, uh, non-commissioned officers, all the way down to the ground level. Everybody has to figure out how to do their part of the job in order for it to happen effectively. And so one of the things about the British Army in the First World War is that they learned at all of those levels, and then in 1918 they all went home. And all of that knowledge disappeared for a while. And I'll come back to that uh, when we get towards the end. Let me start off by pointing out something about this. Is Britain actually fought World War I with, with two armies. And what I mean by that is not that they had a variety of different armies around um, uh, the, the globe. Obviously, there were British soldiers fighting in the Western Front, in the Middle East, um, uh, and elsewhere. But that conceptually speaking, they had two kinds of armies. The first army, the one that they went to war with, was a much different one than the army that they finished off with in 1918. They started in 1914 with one kind of army, and they got, it got destroyed, essentially, and then they created another kind of army, and that was the army that learned and, f and finished off the war um, in November uh, of 1918 as part of a great coalition with the French um, and the Americans um, we might ask, I've been hearing things about how the Americans came in and won the war uh, in 1918. I should note that that's not the opinion of either the British uh, or the French. Um, but that's an argument for another day. Um, the first army that they went to uh, war with, the British Expeditionary Force, uh, as it was called, was a small, by continental standards, professional, highly trained, highly disciplined army and one which focused on the skills and training of the individual soldier. And this is a painting, a post-war painting of them at Mons in Belgium in 1914, 
firing on the German university reservists um, in what came to be known as the Kintermord, the death of the children. Um, Fifteen aimed rounds a minute was the goal for British infantry soldier um, in this expeditionary force. But it was a tiny, tiny army by the standards that the Europeans expected. Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, not talking about this army, but talking about a previous British army, when asked what, would, what he would do if the British launched an amphibious assault on Germany, he said, I would have them arrested. It's not even worth sending my own forces against it. I'll just send the German police um, to, uh, to arrest them. And of course, there's the apocryphal, potentially apocryphal story about um, the Kaiser talking about the contemptibles uh, of the British Army, um, which they adopted and called themselves the old contemptibles um, at the start. When they got over to Europe in 1914, they fought larger than their size. But the war they encountered was one where size was one of the most critical factors going. Size, mass, firepower, and casualty rates were all enormously out of scale with anything that they had done before. And so the British very quickly realized that they had to create a new kind of army, a much larger army. And one, if you look at this picture, does not look remotely the same. This is a picture from 1918 of soldiers in the British Expeditionary Force. They are drastically different than the soldiers before them. And the army of 1918 was an army that relied less on the individual soldier than on mass firepower, on artillery, on air power, on tanks. Uh, and you can see one there. Uh, and while individual skill was important, these soldiers were civilians who had joined for the duration of the war, and they did not have the level of training um, or skill that the uh, soldiers of 1914 did. It's a different army, and it's, it's a fascinating picture. You can't even see the soldiers' weapons in this picture, individual weapons. Now, that, it's a little bit of a, I'm cheating a little bit because they're not actually in active combat uh, in this picture, but it's, a, it's an indicative, uh, it's an indication of the difference um, between the two of them. And one of the stories of the, of the British Army in the First World War is how they got from this army to this army. And what I want to suggest today is that 1916 was the year when they really shifted between the two armies. When the first army, having suffered horrendous casualties, essentially disappeared, and the second army um, a mass civilian army began to come online and began to learn how to fight the kind of war uh, that it was presented. Um, the gentleman who started this process is in the poster on the left, right there. His name is Herbert, uh, Horatio Herbert Kitchener. Margot Asquith, the wife of Prime Minister Henry Asquith, uh, when the war started, did not think of him uh, as much of a minister. He was the uh, Secretary for War, um, but she said he, quote, made a great poster. And I got to say, I agree with him. I agree with her. That mustache alone um, would convince me to join up. Uh, Asquith was also famous for saying to Churchill that if she was married to him, she would feed him poison uh, in, cough, in his coffee, and Churchill responded, because Churchill always responded, if I was married to you, I'd drink it. Uh, Kitchener became Secretary of War in 19, uh, August of 1914, and he immediately decided that this was going to be a long war. Three years, he thought, uh, the war was going to last, and that Britain need to, needed to build a much larger army than it had ever built before if it wanted to play a role in it. He was so foundational to this that it, the army that was built became known as Kitchener's Army, Kitchener's mob, if you are a little more critical of it, but one that was wholly identified uh, with him. And among other things, the British began a substantial round of advertising. Um, the, I don't know if you can read the caption, but it's a poster from 1915, Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? Which is a, having a 10-year-old daughter, I can say that's a pretty effective 
poster um, on that one. Kitchener decided that this new army needed two things. Manpower, and that's a picture of the recruiting office uh, in London on August 8th, 1914. Um, as you can see, the line stretches around the block. Um, one of the fascinating things to note is you can tell what class people are from by what kind of head, ha, uh, headwear they're wearing. Bowlers are middle class. Flat caps are working class for the most part. Um, and you can see there's a mix of all sorts of folks. Hundreds of thousands, millions of men responded to Kitchener's call and joined up with the British Army. By the end of 1915, two and a half million men had volunteered to fight in this new kind of army uh, that Kitchener was putting together. Um, the training photograph I put up there to illustrate what kind of training they were doing, I really think they had no idea what they were supposed to do with them, the sergeants, and so they just made them do jumping jacks. Um, uh, but it's an indication of the sort of mob of folks uh, who were coming in to this. The second thing Kitchener wanted to build, wanted to create, was an army with a lot of firepower. That's a picture of a British artillery factory or shell factory uh, in 1915. You can see the way the shells are stretching almost endlessly uh, out of sight. You might also notice that the people who are building those shells are largely women. Um, and a lot of an enormous number of women uh, uh, joined, replaced men who had gone off to war, uh, joined up and built, um, uh, built munitions built shells to serve this new, uh, this new kind of army uh, on that one. I should note, this is also a fascinating illustration of the limits of certain kinds of sources. The photos, most of the photos we have from World War I are black and white. And what that doesn't tell us is that the explosive that the women packed in the shells got under their skins as they were doing it and turned them quite a bright shade of yellow. So much so that, uh, and I've read a source from this, uh, a British soldier came home from the front and went to have uh, tea with his uh, girlfriend and discovered that she had turned bright yellow. And he, did, he hated it. All he could do was stare at the sort of yellow color. She'd really sort of turned, da uh, not Daffy Duck, um, uh, that's, uh, he's, uh, Tweety, Tweety Bird, exactly that shade of yellow on that one. I didn't know about that. I had looked at the photos long before I saw the source because the photos are black and white. It goes away after you stop working. The, the, the explosive works its way out. Now, so manpower and firepower. And Kitchener's army began to come online really at the end of 1915 and the beginning of 1916. And the question then became, what are we going to do with this new army? They're trained at home. They've received a certain amount of uh, instruction, um, but we have to figure out uh, what, what we're going to do with them. And the decision, and you, you've heard some of this earlier, was to use them in a joint uh, Anglo-French assault near the Somme River. Uh, and part of this was to relieve the pressure on the French who had been carrying most of the offensive load, a relief that became even more urgent uh, when the Battle of Verdun broke out. But part of it was also the very strategic calculation about what they wanted to do. This is, this is the Somme region. And if you look, this is a terrible illustration of the German rail network. Um, my Photoshop skills are not enormous. Um, but I added this in. The German rail network ran through Maubert, uh, Mauberge here, down to here, and then there's a link back to Cologne in Germany right there. And what Haig and the planners really hoped to do, at least before the battle started, was to break through the German defenses uh, at the Somme, capture Mauberge, and fracture the German network, rail network, and disrupt not only supplies to the German lines there, but also essentially supplies all along the line. It's a logistics target rather than a tactical or strategic one. And Haig thought once that was done, the British could continue along the rail line to Cologne, on to Berlin, Moscow, Beijing. His ambitions were limitless. 
And it's not, as I think Paul has already pointed out, it was not until much later that he began to talk about attrition as the reason he was doing it. Now, unfortunately, with this picture, I've given the game away because that's the limit of their advance. So they got nowhere near uh, Mauberge or Cologne or Beijing, for that matter. Um, and the question that they had to answer before this battle started is what were they facing and what did they want to do about it? That is, what were the defenses they were facing and how were they going to, what was their aim and, and methods for dealing with those defenses? Um, they were facing, not as, not as uh, organized as, as later in the war, but they were facing a pretty serious German defensive line uh, in the Somme. Um, the, the top left is uh, actually the British trenches later on in the Somme, and you can see they're not particularly dug deep. Um, what they were facing in the Germans were belts of barbed wire, in some places 10 to 13 lines deep. They were facing uh, machine guns um, and trench systems, um, and they were facing uh, tens of thousands of troops. And by 1916, the Germans had actually been able to dig fairly deep under their own trench systems. Um, that, the picture on the left is a entrance to a, a German bunker, and this is a picture of the German soldiers in the bunk, uh, bunker having a lovely game of cards. Um, I should note, uh, some of those bunkers had both running water and electricity, which gives you a sense of how much effort the Germans had put into building them. I should also note there are a number of occasions where British sappers dug under the lines and accidentally broke through into the middle of a card game just like that, um, which did not end well for anybody, um, especially the British on that one. But the British had to figure out, how do we break into that without getting killed by the machine guns and then deal with the German defenders who are left? The way to think about this and the way Haig thought about this is he wanted to do two things. He wanted to break into the German defenses, and then he wanted to break out of them. That is, he wanted to figure out a way to get through the barbed wire into the trenches and deal with the German defenders. But he also wanted to figure out a way to then get past them and into the green fields of France uh, beyond. Um, so it's two things. He wants to do break in and break out. Uh, on his way uh, to Germany. And in essence, what Haig and the planners decided was that they would do, use the, the manpower and the firepower, most particularly the artillery, to break into the German defensive lines. The battle plan for the assault of July 1st, 1916, was to start with a week-long bombardment. They stockpiled two million shells, that's not all of them, um, and used very heavy uh, range of artillery up to and including 13-inch uh, guns um, to attack the German, German lines. The idea was that these shells would destroy the barbed wire and kill the German defenders. And then the British soldiers of Kitchener's army would step up out of their trenches and march across uh, the battlefield and occupy the, um, uh, occupy the German defenses. But how does he break out? What does he have to break out with? He needs something high speed and mobile to break out. And the only thing he's got is cavalry. Haig takes a lot of criticism for keeping substantial amount of cavalry on the Western Front. But in 1916, that's the only thing he's got that will do that second thing that he wants to do. The infantry can break in but they're likely to be exhausted and, and um, have heavy casualties at that point. The only thing he's got that's mobile and rapid moving is cavalry. And so he keeps substantial numbers of cavalry units behind the lines to exploit a break-in because it's the only thing he's got. He, he's not, he doesn't have any greatly over-optimistic ideas about what happens if the defenses aren't broken and he sends cavalry against it but he wants a force that he can use to exploit it. British were horribly clear-eyed about what happened when horses got hit by machine guns, and they were horribly clear-eyed about it because they tested it. They literally took a herd of wild horses and machine gunned them, 
to see what would happen so that they would know on this one. So there's no false optimism in this, he, but he thinks that they can break through the gaps. This is what the German trench system looked like in 1916. And you can see, and I'm sure we all know this, but I'll just remind you, it's not a single line of trenches by then. It's multiple lines of trenches. Um, usually two to three in the front line, what the Germans thought of as the front area, and then farther behind it, another two or three to serve as a place for gathering or counterattacks um, on that one. And this is what the British attacked in June and July of 1917. The barrage started, the artillery barrage started uh, on June 24th, 1916. The upper left is a picture at night from the British lines, behind the British lines, of what the artillery fire looked like. And that's what the German trench system looked like afterwards. You, all these little dark spots are are, t are shell holes. The noise was so loud during that week of shelling that 200 miles away across the English Channel, people in London could hear it as a low rumbling um, in the distance on that one. I'll give you another example of what the result looked like. This is a town near the German lines. Uh, a photographer took a picture of it in 1914 and then he was lucky enough to come back in 1916 to the same town and he took a picture, he tried to locate himself in exactly the same spot and take the same picture again. And you can see what, the, you can see the row of houses there uh, to a certain extent, but it's essentially gone um, in that one. And then on the 1st of July, 1916, the British soldiers went into the attack. Now I want to pause for a second and talk about sources again a little bit, because I've seen, I was looking for a photo to use for this presentation, and I came across this one um, in my files as being from the Somme, but I've also seen this used for American soldiers going into the attack, and I think, in fact, we saw it in the little video we saw earlier today. Um, and I'm not looking at that, I'm not entirely sure that's not staged. It's a little too good makes me a little paranoid. There's some indication that this is actually a photo taken during the filming of what was called the Battle of the Somme in 1916 and that it's not actually a photograph. I'll give you two other photos I found. The top one. This one I show, this is one I show to my students and I say, photographers captured a great moment, soldiers going into the attack, one suddenly killed. And then I ask them, where's the photographer standing? The photographer has stepped up out of the trenches, walked with his back to the Germans, waited for the attack to go in, not gotten hit by any bullets, and then managed to snap a picture of someone getting killed. It's clearly a fake. The bottom one's a little more interesting. This one I thought was real, taken perhaps from a balloon or something like that. But then I found the scale model they used to take the picture of it in a little British museum in the southeast. It's actually a picture of a model. And these folks are little soldier. Um, it's pretty good. OK, let me show you an actual picture. As far as I can tell, uh, this is British soldiers going into the attack. They're heading away from the camera. Um, they have just gotten out of the line of trenches. You can see the dirt there. And they are heading off um, towards the German uh, front lines. And I think everybody in this room knows already that the attack was a disaster. The shells did not cut the barbed wire. The German defenders survived below in their bunkers. And on the first day of the Somme, 57,000 British soldiers became casualties. 23,000 dead and the rest wounded. It was the worst day in the history of the British Army in terms of casualties. And that first day has become the story of the Somme to a certain extent. There are books that are just about the first day of the song, about the attempt and the catastrophe. But the battle went on. Haig kept fighting. The battle didn't end on July 2nd. It kept going until November of 1916. And one of the things that happened during that period was that this new army of soldiers who had experienced horrible losses on the first day started to figure out how to fight 
this new kind of war. They actually started thinking about it. And this is at all levels. The uh, generals, staff officers, combat soldiers started thinking about how to fight this kind of war. And I'll give you just one example um, on, uh, just one example to highlight what I mean by this. If the artillery bombardment doesn't work, how about having the artillery sort of lead the soldiers through the defenses? Sometimes called a creeping barrage. You'll have, the artillery will, will hit 150 to 100 yards ahead of the soldiers and it'll move slowly ahead and the soldiers will walk along behind it smoking a cigarette and enjoying themselves. I mean, I'm exaggerating. Think about, that may work, think about all the levels of understanding that that requires. The soldiers have to know how close they can get to the barrage without being in danger. The artillery men have to know how to fire the barrages at exactly precise aiming sites. And they have to do it consistently for thousands after thousands of shells. Just one question, how rapidly do you move the barrage, took them about a year to figure out. They started off at 50 meters per minute, and that turned out to be much too fast. And by the end of the war, they were going 50 meters every four minutes. But at every level, the soldiers in the army has to figure out how, it's, how to do this and learn how to do this. In addition to that, lots of other things were beginning to come online. Cavalry, your only mobile force, let's build something that will survive better than cavalry and put it into action. Um, and the first tanks, although they had been started long before 1916, began to come online at the Somme uh, later on during the battle. Uh, have trouble getting into the German defenses, let's use gas to uh, attack them. And the Somme was one of the first big uses of gas by the British. And they got very sophisticated with gas, just to give you another example. If they discovered that the Germans were good at getting their gas masks on quickly, they would fire, before they fired mustard gas or the British equivalent, they would fire a, what they called a penetrating gas, which made, if you inhaled it, it would make you throw up. Well, imagine being a German soldier with the gas mask on, and this penetrating gas gets through it, and now you have a choice between throwing up into your gas mask or taking it off. And then the British would fire the stuff they really wanted you to breathe. So again, this is a level of understanding and sophistication that they are learning um, in 19, uh, 1916 and slowly beginning to apply um, at the Somme. And just by way of sort of going through and, and finishing up, let me, let me talk for a minute about uh, what kind of challenges that this army had to do to manage this kind of learning and understanding. Just to give you one example, a lot of people learned, a lot of soldiers learned their lessons, learned how to do something in the process of getting killed doing it. You figure out how to do something, but you figure out how to do it, and you get killed as a result. And you never have a chance to bring that lesson back. And so that's a particular problem for an army more than almost any other kind of organization, is a lot of the lessons get about how to do something get learned by soldiers who are either killed uh, or wounded uh, as part of the process. And you have to bring the lessons back, you have to figure them out, and you have to get them to all of the soldiers you want them to understand. By the end of 1916, the British Army was three million men strong, and every one of those lessons that you wanted them to know had to be taught to them, had to be trained into them, and had to be carried forward. And so the result over the next two years after 1916 was the slow process of learning by the British Army. Sometimes it went well as at the beginning of Passchendaele in 1917, and sometimes it went very badly um, as uh, at the end of Passchendaele uh, in late 1917. But it ultimately led in 1918, this learning process to a British force that was able to, starting in Amiens in uh, August of 1918, was able to, along with the French and the Americans, 
overwhelm and defeat the Germans in the space of what came to be known as the Hundred Days. The British Army that fought the end, uh, World War I in 1918 was probably the most powerful uh, military force the British have ever put into the field. And that learning process started in 1916 and carried through to 1918. And let me wrap up, finally, by pointing out that as soon, and here's some of the things that they use, that as soon as that army learned what it was doing, it all went home. From 3.8 million in size in 1918, after demobilization, the British Army was 300,000 men strong. All of those soldiers who had learned the lessons went home. The lessons were never gathered. The lessons were never understood. The lessons were never preserved. And that's another problem to think about um, with lessons learned is that you have to figure out a way to transmit them to the next generation of soldiers. It's notable, and I would argue, it's notable that I, I would argue that it's notable that that army had one last renaissance, that that method of battle, of firepower, of um, figuring out how to break through heavily defended lines, had one last renaissance in 1944 and 45. Montgomery was a staff officer in the British Army of the First World War in 1917 and 1918 and the methods he used in Normandy in 44 and 45, which he called colossal cracks, were exactly the methods that the British Army used in 1918. The lessons they had learned helped the British Army of the Second World War win the battle that they were faced with. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.